Okay, welcome back. Uh, sorry, online students, we can hear you now. So if there's any question before we get started, please uh, share or please ask and we'll uh, go forward after hearing your questions. Any questions, Gertrude, Lucy, any questions, any comments? No, sister. No, sister. Okay. All right. Okay. So we were talking about um, how do we undergo personal transformation? Okay. How can we have these three very important part of our beings, our attitude, our temperament, our behavior, more aligned to what God desires, and so that we will have healthy, fulfilling relationships. Again, okay? what can we? What can we do to uh, live out these these truths? So, I, as I said, we're going to look at four things, four truths, and look at how the first two have already been established. The second two is what we are going to walk in. So, the first one is the power of the cross. So, what did the cross purchase for us? What did Jesus on the cross purchase for us? Forgiveness, Forgiveness redemption. Salvation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So in all of this, God bought us freedom from sin. Right? Freedom from the power of sin. Not just freedom, but also bought about healing. I don't know how many of you all were there for the morning's emotional healing. Some of you were there for it? Okay. So we, we were... I think in that session, what, what we spoke about was that a lot of our attitudes and our behaviors can be byproducts of some of our life's experiences. Maybe the traumatic experiences we've gone through, um, uh, something somebody said about us, some things that we've gone through that actually formulates our attitudes formulates the way that we respond and behave. Yes? Right? Um, so let me give you an example. Maybe uh, in your parents' marriage, you've noticed or you've seen significant conflict. There's always fights, um, uh, mm, strife. You've seen that. So... Does it have a bearing on your attitude? It can, right? So let's let's just infer, assume, what can be the attitude that a person may have about marriage? If they have seen their parents fight. Okay, they have a negative attitude. Okay, like what? Okay, and so marriage is... Sorry, Gertrude, say that again. Uh, to be uh, controlling. One of the partner, like, is over-controlling. Okay. And this also is causing a negative... Uh, Correct. Negativity in the married life. Absolutely, right. So, because of the experience we go through, we have these attitudes that we may come with. And so what happens? We tend to play out that same thing even in our marriage. Or like, let's say, like Gertrude was saying, there is a, you may have seen a controlling father. And so the attitude that you have towards all men is that they're all controlling. Right? And so what happens is our lives become very, very diminished as a result of some kind of that attitude. So when we come and and lay down these attitudes before God, we're saying that the cross has the power to remove away any attitudes that are sinful. Right? When we look at... So how does it become sinful? The very fact that God created marriage to be good, yet we assess it to be manipulative, controlling, uh, you know, not productive, is that a sin? It is, right? Because we're not seeing it in the way that God sees it. So we, we have taken over a very distorted meaning of marriage and we operate from that. 
And so everything that we do is going to be sinful. The way we think about the uh, maybe our spouse, the way that we feel towards them, all of that become comes out of a sinful fleshly uh, space. Is that right? So the power of the cross, what Jesus did on the cross was to bring us freedom. Bring, uh, bring us freedom from every bondage of sin, every part or everything that uh, creates the dominion of sin, whether it be in our body, in our soul, as well as in our spirit. So the more that we um, take on or believe or live by what the power of, uh, of the cross did for us, the more freedom that we experience. Yes? Okay, let's look at a verse. Um, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 6 and 14. Can someone read that? And we know that our old being has been put to death with Christ on his cross in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed so that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Sin must not be your master, for you do not live under law, but under God's grace. Okay, so any of these attitudes that come by, um, we, we receive healing for all of those wounds that were created because of what Jesus did for on the cross. It's a done thing. Jesus doesn't have to get on the cross again for us to be forgiven of maybe a current attitude that we may experience right now today. Right? It's already a done deal. It's already a done thing for you. So what does that mean? That you don't, you and I do not have to be slaves to some of those habits or those patterns or those thinking. We don't have to be slave to it. We have experienced that freedom. So we must claim it, take it for ourselves, and walk in it. So let me give you an example of, a, let's say, um, you must have heard this example before. You take a slum child, you take a child from the slums and bring him to a mansion, to a big palace. You must have heard this example before, right? Right? What should the child do if, if he lives with that slum mentality? Is he living in freedom? But how does he live in the palace mentality? How should he live? When he forgets. Okay. Uh, how do you do that? Yes, so you consciously leave behind your slum mentality and take on the palace mentality, right? So most of the time it's not something you do. It's something you change in your mind. You keep reiterating that to, to yourself and saying, you know, by the cross of Jesus, I have freedom. I do not have to live in anger or live in fear or live in that sense that, you know, this controlling view. I do not have to live in that. It's that, it's something that you, it's like a put on, like you put on something, you know, when you change new clothes and old clothes, what do you have to take out the old and put on the new? So it's that, to be able to put on, to take it, to, to live it, to just accept it and go forward. Because we, all of us, all of us live in that slum mentality. Ayo, but then this is how I feel. You know, this is what that marriage looked like. Mine is like this. We live in that, the bondage of it. And that's why we said that it's something that's done for you. All you have to do is accept it. All you have to do is um, walk in that which is provided for you. It's like someone's given you chapels, but you still choose to walk barefoot. No? So what do we do? The chapels are there. Just get on it and walk. But sometimes the thorns and the stones are very, very comforting. Huh? No? But but we don't see that there is so much more comfort when you wear the chapels. It's that freedom is there. So it's a renewing of the mind. It's, it's something that has to click in the head. And maybe it's something that you have to keep 
And that's why the renewing of your mind comes. It's something that you do on a regular basis. But what Jesus has done on the cross, has, it's a done deal. It's a finished work. It's a completed work. Nothing has to be repeated. Okay? So that's the first one, the power of the cross. Now, also when, uh, when we're looking at the cross, the cross is also a symbol of forgiveness. Right? We are extending forgiveness to maybe someone who has hurt you. That's the freedom that we have from what God did. What did Jesus do for us? He forgave us so that we can also forgive others. So it's a, you know, it goes hand in hand. It's like this you're saying, you know, uh, I want to be part of the uh, part of uh, um, of eating the cake, but I'm not willing to give it to anybody else. Right? You are hungry, but someone gave you a nice pastry to eat and say eat, and then someone else comes to you and says, "Give me one piece." Of course not. I won't. That's not how the Lord Jesus wants of us. What has been given to us? What has been given to us, forgiveness, is to be extended to others. So what areas in our lives, especially uh, in, in, the, in our attitudes, that we need to forgive someone else? Maybe somebody has said something to us that has created a, a whole, a, 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 a big wound within us that we can't seem to operate in anything outside of that. But that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do, is to forgive. Because our forgiveness is done, our freedom is done, it's for us to extend. So the power of the cross. Okay? All right? Are we here? All right. The next one is your identity in Christ. Again, this is not new. You all have learned this in first year. That we are... We are one with Christ. We have been identified. We are in Christ. We are in Him. Our identity is in Christ. Why? Because we are a new creation. And what is a new creation? The old is gone and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 And so our identity is or our, our identity or, the, or our standing before God is um, is in him, which means we are blessed, we are sanctified, we are empowered, we are holy, we are righteous, we are healed, we are overcomers, we are blessed, right? Those are all the things that he has brought about for us. So we live out of that life, out of the newness, new creation life, that is in us, out of that, the identity that, that is given. So uh, again over here, how do we change this? How do we build our identity in Christ? By renewing our mind. By renewing our mind. Again, it's the change in our perspective, in our thoughts. We change that, right? Uh, especially in the way that we see ourselves. Maybe growing up, you were probably told many things, given many nicknames. We were all given nicknames, no? not, not Bablu, Chikku, not that, I don't mean that nickname, but some names that people have called us that has stuck, negative names. Isn't it? Yeah? that sticks. I feel like telling a story right now, but but this is something to laugh about also. But anyway, so when I was in fourth grade, uh, I have a sister who's seven years older than me. Okay, So in fourth grade, I was a very thin, I was like a stick. I was tall, but I was like a stick. But my sister is a little bit more on the plumper, rounder side. And she was seven years older than me. So by the time I was, when I was eight, she was 15, 16. So we were walking to school one day. 
okay <laughs> and you can imagine the, if you can imagine imagine it okay there's one one long stick and one nice round fair person and i was in sports so i was quite dark when i was when i when i was in fourth standard third standard fourth standard and there were a group of people who were walking they were talking about something i don't know what they were talking about but then i think i heard or i heard them saying something called beauty and the beast okay they just they just would have said it i don't know if they were referring to us or they were talking i have no idea but that caught my attention and of course as a as a fourth standard child i immediately took on to the the beast and i actually held on to that for very many years of my life and that affected my emotional health it affected my the way that i saw people the way that i saw myself that changed the way of my attitudes till i came to a point of realization many 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 years later i think way into my adult years that that my identity in christ is not a beast my identity in christ is that i am his precious beloved child and how did that change it's just i had to change the way i thought so it's a perspective change so you you see that you know something like that can those labels those negative labels people put on you can affect your self esteem can affect the way your confidence and so the only way to move out of that is to really experience and believe that what god has called you is the name god has for you so there's a there's a story about a um uh you know a huge supermarket all right and in this supermarket uh there are all sorts of things all sorts of valuable non valuable items and they're all labeled and they are given a price tag so the supermarket closes and one night two burglars get into the supermarket and they spend two hours over there but they get out they don't steal anything they just do a lot of nonsense there and you know what they do there they exchange the value or the price tags of different things so something that cost 10000 they exchange the value with maybe a 10 rupees okay so a small ball that cost whatever 10 rupees they swapped it with maybe the cost of a tv okay and the next so that's what they did and they left the next morning nobody knew anything happened but when people started buying things some people went home with a great deal of things they went and bought a tv for some 50 bucks but they went and bought a ball for 10000 it is only uh, hours later that they got to know that something like this had happened so if you look at that in our lives what do we do we allow others to swap our labels so when god's given you a label saying that you are uh, worthy you are precious you're loved someone else tells you you're a fool or tells you you're unlovable or tells you you're a worst thing that so you see how someone else or other situations or even the enemy can swap your label and then we live out of those labels right and so then our attitude and the way that we think about things become very very uh distorted so when we begin to understand what our true identity is we reclaim the real value we have and what's your real value okay that you're a child of god what else you're christ like what else is your value you're precious to christ huh kings and daughters that you will you will you will have great influence right you will establish great things you have the mind of christ right that's your identity that's the true label that each of us have 
And that's something that's already done for you. And so, then comes the next two, is we need to walk in these truths. And the first, first one, of course, is to renew your mind. Renewing your mind means, and how do you renew your mind? There is a standard, which is God's Word, which is meditating on God's Word. So it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if your, if your mind needs to be renewed, you should constantly meditate on God's Word. If there are two 500 rupees notes given to you, one fake and one uh, genuine, how will you know which is fake, which is genuine? Huh? By looking at properly, OK. By checking, OK. Exactly. If you know the, the genuine one, you will be able to discern the fake. So similarly, if you know God's word, you will identify when someone is exchanging your label. And if for us to know that, you have to get back into God's word. You have to constantly meditate or know what it says so that we can live by that. Yeah? Okay? So, and again, this morning I was sharing four points. How many of you were there? Let's see if any of you remember. How do you renew your mind? Remember? The first thing I said is you have to guard your mind first of all, no? You guard your mind. And how do you guard your mind? You guard all the gates of your mind. What are the gates of your mind? You know, your mind has gates. Which are the gates? Front gate, back gate, left gate, right gate? Your eyes, your ears. Yes, yes. Your eyes, your ears, your mouth. Yeah. And what you receive inside. Those are the gates. You have to guard those gates. So the more that you watch rubbish, the more rubbish is going to get inside. Right? And your renewal will not happen. So guard what you see, guard what you're hearing, guard how you respond. Okay? The second thing that I said was to taking every thought captive. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.5 says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to? To whom? Hello, good morning. To Christ. Where are we? Make it obedient to Christ. OK, so how do you take captive? And I said three hours. Anyone remembers? <laughs> You're guessing. <laughs> Recognize. Forgotten. Recognize. What is the second one? Third, the second one I forgot. Third one is replace. Uh, give me a minute. I forgot. I only forgot. Give me a minute. Uh, okay, I can't find the PDF. Okay, so it's a recognize. Um, so you recognize what the thought is. Okay, refuse, yes. Recognize, refuse, and replace. So you recognize what the thought is that is that is um, not right, or the attitude that's not right. Refuse it. Say nothing doing. I'm not going to let you in. And replace it. Replace it with God's word. So that's how you renew your mind. Recognize, refuse, and replace. So keep renewing your mind. So this is something that we need to intentionally do. On a regular basis, we continue to do that. And the last one is walking in the spirit. Following, lead, being led, being guided by the Holy Spirit. When you do that, what are you giving him influence over? Huh? Yes, you're giving him influence over your life. 
your words, your deeds. So every every time you're faced with some a trigger person, someone who makes you angry, what can you do? Say, Holy Spirit, help me to say, say the right things. May I be led to do the right things, to say the right things. I yield to you. Take away all my fleshly need to retaliate. You help me. Work with me. So, so living and yielding to that is what we need to do. It says walk in the Spirit. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you do that, things change. Isn't it? It's, it's His character that comes out. So every time, maybe when someone called you a name, Okay, the first thing you you do is you call them back two x times. But this time you're saying, "Holy Spirit, teach me. What should I say?" And you say, "Oh, my loving brother." Does that does that make a difference? It does, isn't it? It does. And how can we do it in a joyful and a unaffected manner? I believe it's not on our own. It it can never happen on our own. Because it doesn't, that doesn't work in us. We're, we're always of the flesh. But when we yield to the Spirit, we do away with the work of the flesh. And we, we live by, uh, by what the Holy Spirit does. So what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on, uh, uh, when we, are in, we invite the Holy Spirit, we crucify that part of the flesh, the part of ourselves that tends to bring out the deeds of the flesh. And so we walk in, in the Spirit. So we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16. Let's say that, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. OK? So in order to think, to act, to behave like Christ, to have a Spirit-controlled temperament, to have a Word-governed behavior, we need to live out of the power of the cross, our identity in Christ. We need to have a renewed mind, and we need to be walking in the Spirit. OK? So when we do that, how, how much more beautiful and lovely would marriage be? It's like heaven on earth, no? Your home will be like heaven on earth. Right, Nelson? Your marriage will be like heaven on earth. OK? All right. OK. Now, maybe for your personal, um, um, you know, just to, just to know your, your how, how you are, uh, go to the application page in, on, on page, I don't know, what's the page? 60. On page 60, and you can see the first table where it says, in personal life. Right? Take some time to just fill the first one, not when relating to your spouse or children, just that first part. Take some time to go through it and see how do, how do you think you respond? Because it'll give you a good page 60, 62. Oh, OK, sorry, page 62. It'll give you a good um, understanding of how, what your attitudes, what your behavior, what your temperament is like. So take maybe two to three minutes to do that, or five minutes to do that, and uh, we can look at one or two examples.
Okay. All right. Let's just look at a few uh, of these. Um, you know, just some descriptions of attitudes and reactions in a given situation. Okay. Um, so the first one says, I try to find the good in people and see the good in them. I try to see them as God would see them. Okay, what are your thoughts on that? I try to see the good in people and see the good in them. I try to see them as God would see them. How easy is it? How difficult is it? Huh? Moderate? Huh? Quite frequently? Okay. Suppose it's someone... Uh, who keeps who keeps doing harm to you how easy is it it's not easy it's not easy at all no when you when you see that like i keep thinking the person who comes to help me in my house to sweep and swab I tell him a hundred times a hundred things, but he doesn't do it. And to actually say, to find the good in them and see, see him as God sees him, it's definitely not something I can do on my own. I don't know if you, if you understand the gravity of what I'm saying, but you know, when someone comes to help you in the house and all the corners are still dirty. It's got all the mud collected there. And when you see it, what happens? That rage comes up, no? And then when he comes the next time, I'm waiting to say something. So it's, it's not easy. Okay. I'm just being very honest. Okay. Um, let's look at... Uh, I'm ups if I'm upset or angered, I pray, release, let go and get over it quickly. Quite frequently, okay. Very rare. Yeah, yeah. So that that again is something that can, you know, to be able to release it to God and say, God, I leave it to you and you know move ahead. Okay. When people criticize, offend, or insult me, I see the Holy Spirit's help and rise above it quickly. Huh? Quite frequently. Okay. All right. Well, online students, what's happened to you? Don't hear anything from you all. Okay. I see mistakes as opportunities to learn from and improve. I ask, I ask God to help me learn and gain wisdom from my mistakes. Something students can relate to almost always. Students, you get 10 out of 100 in a test. And then? All right. I speak positive, hope, encouragement, faith into those around me. Almost always. Okay. I enjoy life. It's exciting to be alive. I'm loving it. Very good. Wonderful. Okay. The next part when relating to your spouse, after a few years of marriage, sit and do it. Okay. All right, and let's hope and pray that each of them will be good. Okay, so we'll just move on quickly on uh, some examples. Okay, and I think some of these examples are nice to read through uh, and understand. Okay, so um, what do you do if you do notice some behavior issue in your spouse? What would you do? Let's say you have a complaining spouse. How will you tackle it? Asapu. How she always complains. What will you do, Asapu? Someone who's always complaining, anything you do, she'll be complaining. What do you want to do? What, what? You will go sleep. Huh? 
you will eat biryani and sleep <laughs> uh, so just go sleep huh? okay gertrude you have a you have a question address it no, i want to answer that question yeah yeah please go ahead please go ahead yeah i would um uh try to explain and uh, like speak positively and uh, you know by complaining that we can't do much because i also complain a lot but i have learned over the period that you know it doesn't help you to move forward uh, so you know you look at the positive things more than the negative things in your life and try to change you know this okay. yeah yeah okay thank thank you gertrude uh, wonderful wonderful yes Asa, asapu please take the mic everyone wants to hear your no 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 everyone wants to hear i will not give the opportunity to complain again because i will make everything you'll make everything good huh? there is no way to complain <laughs> okay meet me after 10 years <laughs> okay all right so yeah what else will others do Okay. Okay. Uh. Okay. Okay. Good. Come on. you read god's word <laughs> okay all right so in a marriage we are called to be accountable to one another right and but yes that accountability doesn't mean it becomes like a huge blame game it should be done gently lovingly prayerfully okay and not that it will go well always but nevertheless the attempt is definitely something that we need to make okay uh but you should do this you should have an agreement that you all are willing to be accountable to one another so before you get married agree with your spouse and say you know we should be we should be each others iron iron sharpens iron so i'll be your iron you be my iron and uh, what you say for me is for my betterment what i say for you is for your betterment so that's that's a that's a great place to be in when two people can be willing to uh, walk together in that okay so there are some examples of, over here so let's see this okay so when your spouse is complaining or grumbling about the way things are certain situations at home work church or other setting here is how you can respond asapu you'll read it asapu in the table attitude and behavior transformation how should you respond asapu 63 yeah ah uh, it's here is how you could respond it says no second part 65 ah uh, read i understand that what was that? not that not that the one before First one. What if we see that God that is happening? The good. So good that happening, and we choose to accept and enjoy the God instead of focusing the good instead of focusing on not so good. So that's one way you can respond. Yeah. Okay. When your spouse feels offended and carries unforgiveness, resentment, and is inclined to retaliation towards those who have brought pain. what will you how will you read uh, what can you say uh, blessy i understand that what was done was unfair and has hurt you but with god's help we can forgive and still love them. okay so when your spouse is comparing with what you have with someone else and seems to be jealous and envious women
Third one, third one. Maybe we should look for the good. No, 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 no. Let us choose to celebrate the one before that. Let us choose to celebrate. Oh, the point is not there for you? Oh, okay. All right. So then let me read it. Let us choose to celebrate the other person, be happy for God's blessing, and let us be thankful for what we have. Okay. When your spouse is critical of people, pointing fault in others without helping uh, bring about positive change, that's there? Yeah. What, what should you, what can you say? Maybe we should look for the good and see the good in that person. Or maybe we should see how we can help that person overcome those weakness. Okay, last one. When your spouse seems selfish, self-centered in a situation, unwilling to give, share, or make a sacrifice, what can you say? Rupus. You know, God has blessed us so much. I am sure we can be selfless. Think about their need, sacrifice a little and a granularly by giving something to them. Okay, and be generous by giving something to them. Right? So accountability, yet loving, yet patient, yet kindly. Okay, so these are some ways that we can respond. Okay, all right, any question? Any questions from the online students also? For those who understand, uh, no explanation is required. And for those who seek explanation for everything, how much ever you make them understand, they're never going to understand. So mm -hmm. what is the right approach there? when there's too much of complaining, too much of strife for everything? Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I say, you know, coming to before you even start to come to a place of being uh, uh, willing to be accountable to one another. That's it's like an agreement that you were saying we will if we find anything negative in the way that we speak, we say the other person will be our reflection. The other person will be our mirror. Right. So that helps, I think, because in some way they're open to hearing. Yes, it has, of course, it has to be mutual. It definitely has to be mutual. Yeah, there are some times that people don't. Um, in my opinion, keep doing it lovingly, keep doing it uh, patiently. Um, and keep hoping and praying that you know that will change and that will help them to see things differently. Maybe at some point of time it may be okay, but then over time it will be harmful, right? Because the other person is also looking to have some response, eliciting a response from you. And when you keep silent, then it it means it could mean many things. It could mean indifference. It could mean uh, uncare. So many of that, right? So it it may be important to respond, and uh, you know, and that you're not in ways of blame or accusation, but like we said, in loving terms of it. Okay. Done, Asapo? Yeah? Okay. Key takeaways. What did you learn today, Asapo? Mm. Anything that you learned? Mm. Okay. So spouses have to be accountable to each other. Okay. Uh, Komal, what did you learn? Okay. Okay, so what should our attitude be? Okay, all right. Uh, Sugat, what did you learn? Like what? Tell me one. 
Anything one that you learned? Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is something that is, like I said, it's not just for marriage, but for any other relationship that you can build on this, learn this. Okay. All right. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Can someone, can somebody over here in class pray? Diksha? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for the all the information, Lord, that we are learning from your word, Lord. Help us that whatever we are learning to keep in our heart, Lord Jesus. And as we are learning here, it will show the results in our future, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that and they will, when we will follow all these things, Lord, we will show your nature, Lord. We will reflect your nature, Lord. Help mm -hmm. us to each one of us, Lord, follow your word, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all so much. God bless. We'll meet you next week. Thank you. Thank you.